Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and I just have a couple of fast announcements here. On uh, May 6th is our next intro to plant-based nutrition that's at 9 p.m. Eastern, 90 minutes, quick start to understand how to implement a plant-based diet and get your questions about logistics and that kind of thing answered. And then on May 9th, uh, Chef Dell, conversations with Chef Dell, of course he'll take your questions about food and cooking, but he's going to do a little workshop to start called Cook Once, Eat All Week, where he will show people how to make a handful of dishes that are related to each other in a very short period of time that you then live on for the rest of the week. And I've seen him do this before, it really does work, and uh, it means that your prep time and, and cooking time for eating well all week can be really reduced once you understand this. So. Uh, you can call the office to get registered for those events. So today I want to talk about dementia and Alzheimer's patients because this affects a lot of our population. Not just the people who have these conditions, but the people who are taking care of them. Usually family, but other people too. Dementia and the increasing incidence of Alzheimer's disease um, is becoming more and more common. And there is a lot you can do to reduce the risk. Diet has a lot to do with this, for example. And um, Neil Barnard's new book called Power Foods for the Brain talks about this. But there's also a lot you can do for people who even have advanced disease. And I love this study. Um, you know, I'm such a proponent of exercise. The Finnish Alzheimer Disease Exercise Trial showed that exercise improved the health of confined Alzheimer's patients. The study included 210 patients who were confined to home, living with a spouse and who served as the primary caregiver. And then the participants were assigned to two groups, three groups actually, had a control group. And then um, the 210 uh, patients were assigned to either home exercise for an hour twice a week or group exercise at a daycare center for an hour twice a week. And then they compared the 210 who engaged in exercise to a control group that was matched. Now, the compliance rate was pretty high. 92.9% .9 of the patients who were in the home exercise group were compliant. It was a little lower in the daycare group. That's, I think, kind of understandable. And all the patients showed functional deterioration during the year, but there was a difference between the home exercise group and the control group in terms of functional independence. And this is very important because it lowers agitation levels in patients and it also takes pressure off of caregivers. Additionally, the uh, group that was participating in exercise had fewer falls and dementia patients are notoriously at high risk for falls. The researchers stated that the reason why the home-based exercise was successful was that it was easier to do, obviously it took place at home, the compliance was high, the protocol was long-term, and the therapists were trained to help patients with dementia, and it does take, I think, some special training to deal with this population. There were some limitations that were noted. The participants were volunteers, all Caucasian, and the study was not blinded, but even after controlling for these things, there were differences differences that the um, uh, researchers found. So the study is significant for a couple of reasons. Exercise is low tech and low expense as a form of therapy. Anything that improves the lives of dementia patients improves their lives but, not, but also their caregivers who are often incredibly burdened uh, trying to take care of these people. And, um, and by the way, diet will help to reduce agitation and slow progression even in advanced patients. So here's the deal. If you want to remain of sound mind, exercise, stay healthy, eat a health promoting diet like the wellness farm style diet, and then you won't have to worry about this. If you are a family member already starting down the path of dealing with these issues, uh, you can make things better with diet and exercise too. All right, so now let's talk about diet and health and what we're doing as we export our awful habits overseas. Fast food restaurants are opening every day in countries like China and India and Singapore. I think I heard that there is a Dairy Queen opening every three days in India right now, which is just astounding. Um, the demand is high, and one of the reasons is that many times people in these countries, they want to be like Americans, and so this is attractive to them, eating American fast food. And um, the problem is that it doesn't take Asians very long who have typically eaten a low-fat, plant-based diet to develop a, um, a fat palate, is what I call a real taste for animal food and fat. 
and, uh, and to demand this even more. And just the size of the populations presents an intoxicating opportunity for purveyors of junk foods like fast food restaurant chains. Um, but the other side of this is the growing population of sick people resulting from poor dietary habits is presenting a challenge for economically stressed Asian economies um, as they begin to develop the same types of health issues as Americans do. They're eating the same diet now. A recent analysis of 52,584 Chinese people living in Singapore showed that those who had fast food meals twice a week had a 27% higher risk of developing diabetes and a 56% higher risk of dying of coronary artery disease. But this is not the only dietary problem that these Asians have. I mentioned before about developing a fat palate, that you develop a taste for um, oil and fat and animal foods. And once that happens, not just the fast food is a problem, but the way that traditional Asian dishes is, are prepared becomes a problem. Our Chinese partner, Dr. Jane Pally, told me that when she was a child growing up in China, oil was a rationed food. Families had to make a very small amount of it last for a very long time. And of course, that kept the fat content and things like stir fry dishes very, very low. Today, oil is readily available and it's used really generously and stir fry dishes laden with oil and lots more animal food because of the increasing wealth in these countries are very, very common. And in fact, I experienced that when I was in Asia, uh, when I've been to Asian countries, that you have to be very careful where you eat because you go to an a, a Asian restaurant, not a chain, not an American chain, thinking you're going to get healthy food. And uh, it might not be the case if they're cooking for the now uh, fat palate of the Chinese population. So uh, the researchers acknowledge this dietary pattern issue that it isn't just the fast food meals um, and that eating fast food is probably indicative of poor dietary habits and lifestyle habits too. But the researchers tried to account for dietary patterns and stated the associations remained positive after accounting for dietary pattern, calorie, cal calorie intake, and BMI of the participants. So Asian markets are a great opportunity for fast companies, fast food companies, as I mentioned, a horrible liability for governments. And you know, I always try to find something positive you can say about this kind of news coming out. Here is my positive take on it. At least it shows that the reason why we're getting sick in America isn't um, ethnicity, it's not blood types and metabolic types. I mean, you feed this bad, high fat food to any population on this planet and they're gonna become overweight and sick. It's happening in Asia, just like it's happened in the United States and it'll happen every place else we export these habits. Well, that's all for today. Have a great day, great weekend. I'll be back to you on Tuesday.